We're delighted uh, for you to join us on the podcast today. I'm super excited uh, because digital marketing is my passion, and I love to speak with, with other digital marketers about strategies and how we can help customers. Uh, today, we're excited to have on the show Evan Knox of Caffeine Marketing. Welcome, Evan, and how are you? Hey, what's up? Thanks for having me. Appreciate it, guys. Welcome. We're so glad you're here. Yeah, yeah. I'm doing good, by the way. Yeah, I'm, on, um, I'm in Michigan with my uh, in-laws, so that's a ton of fun. They live on a lake now, which is uh, nice. it's a good summer vacation. Perfect. That's perfect. awesome. Awesome. All right, so let's, we, we have limited time, so let's dive into it. Uh, so, Evan, how did you get in, into marketing? I remember I was about 12 or 13 years old and I would go to work with my grandfather. My grandfather owned a jewelry store in the Atlanta area. So watches, engagement rings, stuff like the earrings, whatnot. And he pulled me aside one day and he said, hey, we're going to place an ad in the Atlanta Symphony. I want to go ahead and teach you how we're doing marketing and why we're doing it this way. What? And he proceeded to walk me through all the copy that he was writing on the ad, why he was choosing to place an ad in the Atlanta Symphony. Um, the demographics that he typically cared to. So I love this strategy. I remember that conversation. I remember where we were sitting. I remember what bench in the jewelry store it was at. And that was really fascinating to me. And then I worked at a nonprofit about four years ago. And part of my role there was marketing. And I thought, man, I really enjoy this. Like the math and the strategy behind it really um, just made a lot of sense to me. And from there, my, I guess around that time, my, my dad had passed away. And my grandfather was about to retire. And I thought, you know what? I can't help them anymore in their businesses. Um, but I can help other business owners and like them. So that's why I decided to start Caffeine Marketing and really I become I love that really story. That. That, you need to put that on your website. I didn't see that anywhere. <laughs> that story. Okay. Oh, I love that. Um, that. That raises more questions for me. So I, I like that, uh, that idea, too, that the numbers are something that you liked, that you uh, were attracted mm -hmm. to, because I think that's a difficult thing for a lot of people. They have this, when you're doing digital marketing, it's completely intangible. You're not advertising mm -hmm. in a paper you know, product anymore. And so yeah. those numbers are sort of like the security blanket that you hang on to that really shows you what's going on. Um, that's really interesting. It is. Yeah, it, it is. is. I was going to say, it's almost like there's two sides of marketing as well. Like you don't have to be a math person, but yeah. right. in order to have a complete picture, I think you either need to, you need to have somebody who's really good at the math and strategy side, but mm -hmm. also somebody, and it can be the same person, but also somebody who has an eye for aesthetics because yeah. one without the other doesn't make good marketing. Yeah. It's got to be creative. Exactly. No, of course you're, you're perfectly right. And Evan, what, what, what caffeine marketing, how, how do you, uh, why that name? That was my other question. <laughs> yeah. Get that. Well, uh, those small business owners and entrepreneurs and small company executives that we serve, I noticed, hey, we're all, they're always drinking coffee. You know, every phone call that we got on, uh, I was like, hey, what you drinking? Whatever. And they all run on caffeine. That's how they built their companies. And it's not the original name that we started off with, but I, I knew it needed to be changed. Whenever I just started the company to serve people, and then I knew that we needed to shift. So I picked caffeine because it's the thing that grows small companies indirectly through coffee, but also now through marketing. Fantastic story. Fantastic. Yeah, great. That should be on the website too. I love <laughs> <Yeah>. that. <laughs> For sure. All right, All right Evan, t tell us about some of your, the services you're offer. Yeah. Yeah. So each time that we work with somebody, we start with an initial strategy session and I'll actually do that. So I'm the one that will do this initial call with them. And what we'll do is we'll design a funnel, like a marketing funnel for them, because our goal is to make marketing profitable for each of our clients. We do not function as a, I guess, a grocery store of services. You know, we don't have like a menu or services. I personally, I design a strategy for each client. Now it, you know, that which one that we go with might depend on their budget and where they're at, how aggressively they want to grow, go after growing their own company. But um, we, that might look like websites. So we might build a new website for them. We might do social media ads or Google ads. Uh, we pretty much always want to build a sales funnel to so some sort of PDF on the website and a series of emails to educate people. All things that are automated that can help people scale their company repeatedly. So for every dollar that they put in, we want them to get 10 to $20 back is the goal. Fantastic. And when you touch on, on, on something key right there, strategy, 
you know, because I've, obviously I'm, I'm in the same field as you and, 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 and I've seen from time to time where, where customers will come in and say, hey, I, I wanted to do marketing and, and this company just, just started me with something and never assess my goal and what they're doing. And you're completely yeah. right. It's so important to assess the strategy and, and see what, what, what fits uh, best for the, uh, for the client. So that's, that's fantastic. Thanks. I appreciate that. I think that there are certainly, and I'm not at all, I think that there's a place for it. Um, for people that just offer PPC or SEO, you know, whatever, and that's fine. But I found that the business owners that I was working with, they weren't looking for a service. They were looking to grow their company. And so we wanted to, you know, position ourselves as a solution to that problem. Yeah, that's a much different animal because then you have to have that big picture. Otherwise, you don't know where the holes are. So you don't know if you should go get PPC or if you should get SEO or, you know, do the website over or whatever you need. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's critical. No, it right. is. It is. And what it does, what it does, it put, uh, put in center uh, the, the company's objectives, the company's mm -hmm. goals, you know, what, 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 what are they trying to accomplish? And then you'll fit that strategy around that. So that, that, that's great. Yeah. And what I've found is, you know, over time, you hear similar language from these business leaders. Often they'll come to us and they'll say, I hey, really need to get our name out there. And I'm like, okay, what do you mean by that though? Like, do you mean just, you really just want people to hear about you and then go, well, really we want to grow sales. I'm like, all right, well, that's not how you're going to grow sales. It might be, but we really need to get a picture of, are you, do you currently have enough brand awareness? Are people aware that you exist? That's solving the make people aware that you exist problem of, you know, we'll get our name out there. Okay, well, you've got a couple thousand people that know you, that you exist. How about your messaging? Is it clear? Do people understand what it is you offer and what problem that you solve? Um, how easy is it to buy your product or service? So really what we're doing at that point is we're making sure that they have steps along a marketing funnel. So do they have brand awareness? Do they have consideration? And do they have conversion? So we're just trying to pull all these little pieces together to make sure that it's one really easy, frictionless customer journey. Perfect, perfect. So Evan, uh, what, what industries do you serve? What, what are your, your, your client base like now? Yeah, I personally like to serve smaller companies, um, at least by the, you know, the IRS standards of like, you know, 500 or less employees. And that personally just connects me to my, um, my family and my dad who's no longer with us. I think that's my just kind of way to serve there. Now, is it e-commerce? Is it B2B, B2C? Honestly, we've had a lot of success uh, in both. And so e-commerce is really easy because it's a very similar formula and it's very predictable. So if I know a conversion rate on a website, if I know if they have certain email automation flows, what the rates are on those, I can scale an e-commerce business very quickly. And that's a lot of fun. But we also serve a lot of service-based companies. And that's actually really, really profitable. Um, and it's easy for a different way. The e-commerce is easy because it's just a math equation. And then the service-based businesses are a lot easier because they're high ticket items most often. And so a recent example of that is one is a medical sales company that we just partnered with. Um, we built them a website, a sales funnel, and we're currently running Google and Facebook ads. And their current, uh, as of the time of this call, um, is a 17x return on investment. So for every dollar they spent with us so far, they've made 17 back, which well, is incredible. Nice. Yeah. So do you do, ever do B2, B2C or is it just B2B? Yeah, I mean, right now it's pretty even split. Um, so the e-commerce stuff, that's definitely B2C. Uh, and then you've also got the, that would be B2B. Um, yeah, yeah we, we for sure do both, yeah. Okay, so, so e-commerce, you mean people selling things, items? Yeah, stuff, widgets, whatever. And I personally, I think that if you understand, it's really those two main categories. Mm -hmm. You've got... B2B and B2C. If you understand how to do B2B, well, you're going to be able to do that over a lot of different industries, whether that's fintech or, you know, medical, whatever. Um, the principles and the tools that you might use are pretty similar. Whereas B2C, the tools that you use are very similar to other B2C. So most often you're not going to run ads for a Shopify store on LinkedIn. Like it doesn't typically convert that well. Yeah. So we serve both verticals. Okay. Are you finding that with everybody online now, are the tools hiccuping more or have they got it pretty much? I know Zoom was a mess for a while, but it's, it's improved. Um, have you found that everything's improving or are we still having problems somewhere in some places? Yeah, I think you'll, I mean, 
you will always have something, you know, yeah. a website will besides go down, that, you know, solar flare yeah, yeah. And stuff besides that. Right. Yeah. Besides that, I, I think today we live in a time where it is easier than ever to scale a company because where we go back to my grandfather, he placed an ad in a symphony, you know, like that's not scalable. There's only so many shows at the symphony, um, even the newspaper, you've only got a, a certain local audience. So I think today it's afforded entrepreneurs, and business leaders opportunity to scale and grow companies like we never have before and to do it really repeatedly and with a certain system and a checklist. Like we've got checklists that we run for businesses in each vertical that make it really predictable way to scale your company, which is just crazy to me. Like I, I, it would be hard. It's hard for me to explain to my 80 something year old grandfather that I pay this, I pay Facebook, which he barely understands what Facebook, you know, really is, is, um, and then I pay Facebook and somehow that grows this company like double or triple the revenue within a month, you know? So, so Evan, cool. Evan, you, you touched on uh, something very important, conversion rate a little bit earlier. And you and I know yeah. uh, in digital marketing, conversions are, are super important and also the way you, you track yeah. conversions. Tell us uh, your process of tracking conversions for clients. Yeah. So there's two ways. Well, let's go back down both, both verticals. So, the e-commerce side or most B2C, if you could check out and buy, I'm just going to lump anything that you could buy online as e-commerce. In the e-commerce world, you've got a couple different percentages that you want to pay attention to. You've got an add to cart. Um, and let's just make it really simple and say there's add to cart and then reach checkout. So reach checkouts, they actually purchase something. Let's say the add to cart is like 8% and then your reach checkout is 3%, something like that. Once I have enough data, once I've got thousands and thousands of people to that website and I know what percentage of people actually convert on that website, I can then run that math equation like we're talking about and say, okay, well, I know on Facebook we're getting um, people to come onto the website. We're getting a, a thousand people to the website for, I'm just making up numbers here. They're probably totally off base, but like we get a thousand people to go to the website for a hundred bucks. Um, so thousand people on the website for a hundred bucks. And then all of our products are, $3,000. And this is, this would be great, by the way. So far, this math example, this would be a good company to own. <laughs> um, so I paid a hundred bucks, got a thousand people there. And then out of the hundred people that are there, 3% of them convert. So for the hundred dollars that I spent, three people are going to be spending $3,000. That's yeah. crazy. Awesome. That's not realistic, but that means I'm paying a hundred dollars for three and people to buy $3,000 worth of, or $9,000 worth of products. Yeah. So I'm basically tracing that. I'm looking at analytics. You could look at something like Google Analytics if a platform does not have built-in analytics. I always take attribution analytics with a grain of salt, but whatever Shopify is showing you for add to cart or reach checkout, that's fine. You can go by that. Now, if we had, say, a Squarespace site and Squarespace we connected with Google Analytics, we're now also able to track the number of people that downloaded that free PDF on our website or the number of people that have called our, um, you know, called the number on the bottom of our website or have scheduled a call, like they wanted to request a call for a strategy session. Mm -hmm. I'm able to know that track, let's say I'm running Google ads, I'm able to see within Google ads with a pretty strong confidence, maybe within a 40% uh, margin of accuracy that nine people clicked on the phone call option and 12 people re requested a call. And I'm able through code to understand what it is what my results are. So for every hundred dollars I spend, I'm getting 10 phone calls back, something like that. Yeah. Now are you going to go after, like if you had those eight people load the cart, are you going to go after the five that didn't buy that loaded the cart? You're going to retarget. And yeah. Yeah. And there's my two favorite, man, eh, let's say three favorite ways to do that. One is SMS. I wouldn't say it's the top one. It's, it's the third one, but let's start with it. So SMS. So sending text messages, yeah. let's say they, they reach checkout, but they didn't, you know, whatever the, they got to check out, but they didn't complete the checkout. So I have their cell phone information because they entered that in as they were filling it out. But the last minute they decided, nah, I don't want to do it. I don't want to spend a hundred bucks or whatever that is. In this case, $3,000. So they didn't want to spend $3,000. Well, now I can send them text messages to follow up and say, hey, here's a, here's a reminder. We've got your card saved for you. We can only save it for another 24 hours. Um, hey, here's a 15% off code that's good for you for the next 24 hours. And trying to incentivize these people to take that final step it's a really high return on investment because it might cost you a couple of cents to send that text, 
And that little text right there might be the thing that pushes them over the edge. Mm -hmm. You can also show retargeting ads on Facebook or Google that's reinforcing, hey, here's the product, here's how it's gonna make your life better, um, here's the problem that it solves. And then there's also emails. So I like to have the emails and SMS set up before we even start running paid ads in and most cases. And, and that's great. Uh, you know, we in the industry know that uh, retargeting is uh, the conversion, conversion rate on that is really high because you know, we call that double qualified customers. You have, you have seen your right. product and it's just a matter of converting. Well, it's still true. Isn't it true? You have to touch someone, I don't know, what is it now, 15 times before they see it, you know, and, and, and read what you're sending them or, or pay attention because we're so inundated with messaging. Um, yeah. You know, six touches or 10 touches. Now it's like 15 or 18. I haven't even read lately what it is, but it's crazy. I just know it's a lot for sure. But so leaving a lot on the table is my point. If you don't go after those people, because the sales, the, the, the first pass, I mean, what, how much, what's the sales percentage there? It's really low, like 10% or 12% will click yes and buy. The other 80% are thinking about it or they got distracted or whatever, and you just have to keep going or you leave all that on the table. You could get another 50% or 60% you know, purchasing. So that's great. It's very thorough what you're doing. So how it, it should be done, it. right, Andre? Uh, you're, you're, you're on. Uh, so Evan, uh, digital marketing is, is, as we know, is so dynamic and, and ever-changing. Mm -hmm. how, how do you keep up? Yeah. I get asked this question fairly often. Yeah. I think... What I, because I've been doing this a few I mean, years. You can't possibly sleep. You have to be, you know, paying attention. There's more information sleep. available. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I personally, this has been me, right? I've got a, a foundation of knowledge or, you know, depending on who is on our team, has a really good foundation of knowledge on say Squarespace or Shopify development or advertising, whatever that might be. You know, like they're an expert in that. I, as kind of the conductor of all this, I've got a pretty good base level of knowledge of each one, just so I can pull the parts together and understand how it fits in an overall strategy. But I would be anxious all the time because there would always be a new update from Google. Facebook's doing this new thing. We're doing TikTok. Now we're not doing TikTok, you know? Yeah. What I found is a rhythm for me is I will become proficient in the platform or if, whatever that might be. And then I will learn as I go, right? So learn hands-on practical knowledge. Like we're certified um, by Facebook, we're Blueprint certified. So I went through the process of getting trained by them, going through all their courses, um, but I don't look at their new stuff every single day. I've got actual hands-on knowledge in addition to classical knowledge that they teach you what to do. And what I found, I guess I'm trying to say is, I'll get the base level and then what I'll do from then is I'll, we'll just do really good work, learn from what we're doing. And then I'll, we'll kind of lift our heads up every couple of weeks and look around and say, all right, what's changed? What's shifted in the marketplace? Um, what new opportunities do we have right now? Where can we get a higher investment? And often I'm, I'm a partner in a couple of different businesses. So I like to try it out on my own assets or our portfolio of companies. How has COVID impacted your, your business? Are you crazy busy now because people are, valuing the platforms or has it gone the other way? It's very interesting. So let's say caffeine, um, that's like the marketing entity that I run. Uh, when COVID first kind of was aware, we just, I don't know what the right, I don't want to call it starting. That's not the technical term. Uh, but when we all thought, Hey, we might go into mandatory or shelter in place, whatever that season was, I had two or three clients cancel immediately. All the proposals that we had out all dropped through. And then after a couple of weeks, a new set of businesses emerged, ones that saw this as an opportunity to grow. So like they were doing just fine um, and they really wanted to triple down on their business. And then the other ones were ones that had cash or human resources to deploy on this and then wanted to be set up better for the future. And then there also was kind of like this, um, hey, we need to pivot kind of strategy. You know, so there's a lot of businesses that went directly to online or re re were began to rethink what they were doing. So that was caffeine, but I've got, uh, I'm a partner in a couple other ones. So one of them was a fly fishing guide business, right? Well, when we had the shelter in place, we couldn't do fly fishing trips. So we had to put everything on pause, which was a little, I don't want to say nerve wracking because we had margin for that, but it definitely was like, all right, well, as soon as we can open the state back up, we're going to be happy, you know, to, to do this and do it appropriately and safely. Yeah. Um, and then we've had other, one of my other, uh, companies is a one of the e-commerce companies is a window film company so it's windowfilmworld.com 
And what you do is you basically put film upon your windows to make it look, you know, frosted or mirror film or decorative film, whatever. And that had a really big increase in sales. Mm-hmm. And my only guess is because people are at their home and they're thinking, man, I don't, I don't like to look at that window or I'm yeah. tired of my neighbors looking at me. Right. You Home, know? Depot, like Home Depot, Lowe's, they're, all their sales went out of the, up the, to the you know, sky high because people are staying home and taking care of it. Um, mm-hmm. it makes sense. Um, so the, Fed, the feds just came out and said that they're going to hold mortgage rates really low for quite some time because they're, they're moving their focus from inflation. They're not going to be so concerned about inflation and more concerned about job growth. Um, so that sounds like it's going to impact your business. I mean, I think like what you're saying, people who pivoted went online, virtual platforms, all good, but other companies were kind of holding their breath. Yeah. So to see what would happen. So it sounds like maybe we can start breathing again. I mean, do you get that any feeling from your clients that that's what's happening? Yeah. That was very interesting news that they're going to target, I think the language is like average number or percentage of inflation over yeah. the course of time versus yeah. like just hitting the 2% yeah. every year. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think there's even been a shift. It's, it's almost for a while then it was like day to day, like the, just the general temperature with, with other business owners was day to day. And it was very interesting because we were all kind of like, what's going to happen? You know, like, are we, are we going to be okay? Like at, at all of us, like no one felt safe, um, which is fascinating. And then now I feel like we're all kind of used to it. I'm definitely not going to refer to this as the new normal, uh, but there is like an almost of a, Hey, we got to figure this out. Like life has to go on. We got to make it happen. And so even recently, I feel like most business owners are in full acceptance of the current reality and are moving forward or the ones who are choosing to are moving forward and knowing that there is risk. Uh, but I think it's, I, it's not normal per se, but I don't see a lot of timidity with our clients or at least the ones that we're working with. So are, are you, are you seeing clients face to face, uh, again, or is it just virtual? But we're, we're pretty much all virtual anyway. Um, occasionally we'll see clients like I'm flying down to Orlando, uh, beginning of September. Um, but yeah, it's all. Yeah, fly on, fly on Delta because they're keeping the middle seats open. I just saw that today. They've committed yeah. to that. They've committed to it. So that's great. Delta. We uh we just flew here to Michigan on Delta, yeah. and it was great. You was know? it? Yeah, it's good. So so Evan, t- t- tell us about uh, uh tell us about Story Brand. What's 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 that? I know you're 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 big on that. Yeah, I love Story Brand. Story Brand is a seven part messaging framework created by this guy named Donald Miller out of Nashville. And he uses the seven principles of all, pretty much all storylines, some movies, books, et cetera, and uses those and brings those to the marketing world in order to clarify your message so that people want to listen to your marketing message. Because most days people are not paying attention to your marketing messages. We're bombarded with thousands of every single day. And what this does is it cuts through the noise and engages your customers into a story. So the, one of the main principles is instead of talking about yourself, you invite your customers into a story and you play the role of the guide instead of the hero. And I was, I was a big fan of the framework uh, for, you know, a couple of years and I began using it for my own clients, seeing great results and thought, Hey, there's really something to this. So then I went and got trained and became a story brand certified guide by uh, Donald Miller and his team in Nashville. And we offer that with everything that we do. So all the websites, all the advertising marketing funnels, all of them are story branded. And what I mean by that is we're using messaging people actually want to pay attention to. And that really helps us get better results because the copywriting, the overall strategy, it's using less words and they're more effective. And, uh, and, and, and that will, would, would, would explain, you know, your, your process uh, in terms of, you know, incorporating uh, the company's uh, strategy uh, into, a, into that story to, 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 you know, to push that marketing out there. Yeah, so think of it as we have this almost a foundation of a house as far as the marketing strategy goes. Well, let's call it branding. So in branding, like the overall look, feel of the company, I think starts with the messaging. It doesn't start with the colors. It doesn't start with the font. I think it starts with the messaging. And what we want to do is we want to define what it is the customer wants, what's the problem that's getting in the way of what they want, um, how does that make them feel emotionally, and then I'm going to fast forward a few. 
but how does what does success look like for them? And then what does failure look like for them? What I mean is if they buy the product or service, how is their life going to be better? And if they don't buy their product or service, what's at risk if they don't? So how are their lives going to be negatively affected if they don't buy their product or service? When we have that seven part of that framework uh, all ironed out, it's called a brand script. Once we have the brand script ironed out, then we'll create marketing assets with that language. So now that we know the customer is going to go from feeling insecure to confident, that's the kind of the transition that we're going for, the character transformation, all of our ads, all of our colors, um, they're going to illustrate maybe a successful business leader or a really happy mom who feels like she has it all together, you know, whatever that successful aspirational identity is, all of that starts with the messaging in my opinion. So we'll start with the message messaging. Then we can go into stuff like aesthetics, colors, all that jazz, which is fun. Uh, and then it, all of those are tools in the marketing strategy. Like I mentioned before, I like to go through brand awareness, consideration and conversion. And then the actual nuts and bolts of what we might do depends on each client. Like, are we doing a new website? Do they really need a new website? Can we work with what they have? Are we doing social media ads, et cetera? And that's, and that's fun, fantastic, uh, Evan. Messaging is critical, and that's how you, uh, you, you get the right information out there. So uh, for, for my company, we, we typically do like a questionnaire to gather that information. But walk us through the process uh, for you, for a new client. How do you gather information to develop that effective messaging? So... The actual messaging session, I will, so let's say we were already working with somebody. They decided, hey, we want to start with working with Caffeine. What we'll do is we'll send them a series of questions to each person on their team who's going to be in that initial meeting. Generally, we'll pull in up to five really key decision makers at the company. Generally, it's the president, CEO, maybe the marketing guy or gal, uh, then three other executives or board members, whoever. We'll pull them in, I'll pull them in the room. And then we'll have a 90 minute session. But before we have the 90 minute session, we require that they fill out a couple of questions for us. That's really going to get their brains thinking about who is their customer? What is their customer's life like without their product, with their product? What problem do they solve? What makes them unique? All this stuff is meant to prime them for the conversation that we have. And then we go through the story brand process of nailing out those seven parts of that framework. So like I mentioned, it's what does the customer want? Who is the customer? What's the problem that they're experiencing? What's the internal and external problem? Um, and then what's philosophically just wrong about what they're experiencing? Then we go on to talk about how we position them as a guide or how is we um, you know, ultimately help them win uh, or avoid failure. So all of that is part of that messaging uh, time together. That's fantastic. That's your initial consult? Yeah, for the messaging it is. Um, so we'll have, if we, if we get back up, if somebody wanted to engage with caffeine, what we do is we have an initial strategy call and it's almost like an audit. So I'll, I'll come and I'll meet with whoever the business leader executive is uh, via zoom. And then we'll get an assessment of their current status. So what are they doing in revenue? How much does their product or service cost? What's the margin in their product or service? What are their revenue goals? What are they currently doing for marketing? How much are they spending on advertising? What platforms are they doing? What's the return on ad spend? A lot of questions that sometimes business owners don't even know the answers to. So <laughs> they're pulling in, you know, they're texting their uh, whoever, their, their tech person. Hey, what's this? You know, what's our conversion rates or whatever. So anyway, all that does is helps me build a better picture of can we actually do marketing that's profitable for them? Because they, at the end of the day, I really want to make marketing that's profitable and help these business owners or business leaders be successful. And if we can't, I, I won't work with them. And that probably happens one out of five times. I ultimately say, hey, their business model is not where it needs to be yet. They really don't have a clear idea of how to, um, honestly, sometimes it's just too early on for this to make sense. Other times there's not enough margin in their products or services. And those are tough spots to be in. But I really, I don't want them to pay us and then not see the return that I think that they deserve. Yeah, that makes me wonder, do you, uh, do you work with people who are just starting a business to help them develop all of that story? Or do you prefer that they've been in business for a while? So caffeine marketing does not work with startups. However, I, I do that on the side as an investor. So I will come in and function as like a fractional CMO. Um, not always for equity, but most of the time. Oh, that's interesting too. Fantastic. Okay. You know, uh, uh, someone may be listening or watching and, and, and you know, they, they're saying, you know, there are a lot of digital marketing companies out there. Uh, so what differentiates you from the competition? I think it is that we have a focus on making marketing profitable. 
And we pretty much always hold true to that so much so that we don't have long-term contracts. I think the longest ones that we have are like 60 days because ultimately at the end of the day, if it's not profitable for the client, we don't want to do it. And so I'm always keeping my clients updated on, Hey, what is your return on investment here? Not just how many clicks or impressions that you're getting. I personally don't care about that. I mean, I care about that as a data point, but I really, at the end of the day, I care about making my clients money and growing their companies. Cause I think when I grow their companies, I'm also help growing the middle class. I'm also helping feed families, um, improve communities, all of that stuff I think matters at the end of the day. So you touched on profitability. So based on your experience, what platforms are, are most profitable? <sighs> I think you have to start like, let's just see, I think to, to answer that question for you, I feel like I have to just add a disclaimer. They have to have the right stuff in place below the advertising platform. So let's say they had a beautiful Squarespace website or a really a highly optimized uh, Shopify website had those. Let's also say that they had a sales funnel. So they had some sort of free PDF or guide on their website that people could give their email in exchange for, and then a series of emails to follow up with them to make them want to buy their products or services. So let's assume we had that. Then I would say Facebook ads is my favorite. I love to start there. The targeting that they have is superior to really any other platform. The tracking that they have is better. Right. Um, overall, you're able to track people, not IP addresses. So I'm able to track people across devices, attribute conversions across devices, and not just with Google, I'm only able to see what computer you were on. If you didn't buy it on the computer, you bought it on your phone. I don't track that. I'm not able to track that conversion. So that's why I like Facebook the best. And then LinkedIn and Google are different in so many ways. And when I mean Google, I also mean YouTube. And I like them both, but not. it's not going to work for all, all businesses. You know, one of our clients is a female financial advisor coach. You know, it's like her and a team of people. Most women who are female financial advisors are not searching for a female financial advisor coach. Like we actually have to go to them. Um, and so LinkedIn and Facebook are a lot more profitable in that regard because there's just not the organic search traffic for that on Google. That's perfect. So how, how do you, for, how do you formulate the right uh, digital marketing budget? So it initially starts with the test budget. If somebody comes out and says, Hey, you should just be spending this much per month. And they say that declaratively, like that's just what you should be doing going forward. They don't, they don't know, I sound bad here, but they don't know what they're doing. Um, because really what you want to do is you want to establish a test budget. Once you have the right tracking in place, I can then, we can then figure out, hey, what's the return on investment for you? Generally within the first month. So unless you have a really long sales cycle, which does happen, but you've got other lead measures besides that, like how many people requested a call or whatever, stuff like that is appropriate when you don't have immediate conversions. Like the more, like there's, there's some industries that take multiple months to convert. So to go back, um, I would say that you might want to do 10 X what you can afford for your margin for a single customer. So let's say a customer is worth a thousand dollars to you over the course of the relationship with you. I would invest 10 times that into a campaign. Now that could include the agency fees. That's fine. That, that should include the ad spend, whatever that is. Um, but I think that you have to be willing to invest 10 times what you can afford to acquire a new customer to really give it a good test. But I also put that as a word of caution. If you don't know what you're doing, you can waste a lot of money on advertising very quickly. I know, I know. Evan, it has been a fantastic conversation. Man, there are several different things we wanted to dive in. To, uh, we may need to do a part two on this, but I want you to just tell our audience, how can we reach you? I appreciate it. And thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. If anyone wants to reach me, I've got a free guide on my website, um, evannox.com, as well as caffeine.marketing. And it'll teach people how to build a sales funnel and a marketing funnel that's really profitable. And it's like a checklist. Like if you were building a Lego kit, it's that easy. Um, and like I mentioned before, just need your email for that. That's a valuable freebie, guys. Everybody should yep. get that. Of course, of course. Thank you so much for, for being with us today. It was great. Yeah. Thanks again. Have a nice day. Thank you. You too.